Our second question comes from uh, Andrew. Uh, Andrew writes, hey guys, attached to this idea is an idea I have for forming up a monolithic garage slab. Is it dumb to put two inches of foam against the form boards before pouring? I like the idea of the two by four sideways on top to keep the foam in place and to screed off. I'm going to have two inches of foam under the slab and a vapor barrier. Everything is over several inches of compacted three quarter inch clear stone. Any thoughts on the slab or forms are appreciated. I'm in Wisconsin. Thanks, Andrew. So uh, the question is, what's the best way to form and insulate a thickened edge or a turned down slab? And since he's in uh, Wisconsin, I think you're a logical uh, person to answer this, Ian. I guess I wonder, is he also First, going... Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Ian. Can you yeah. kind of explain Andrew's um, uh, form work and how he's arranging uh, this Yeah, uh, so it's... It's, it's a haunch it's a haunched slab so the way that you would you would form this is typically with a a two by 12 or uh, in this case it looks like he's got a two by 12 with a two by six added to the bottom of it so he's he's got to get some depth on this haunch but you have a deeper perimeter to the pad and then that is supposed to help uh, act as uh, kind of a foundation for the pad so that uh, you know, it's not just a four inch pad poured on top of uh, ground that's going to freeze and thaw over the course of the year. Uh, it's pretty common for small sheds, single car garages. Uh, I've seen a few people do two car garages with this type of slab work and they'll sometimes put a, another haunch down the middle so that you have a, a deeper uh, middle section of concrete as well. But I guess I'm wondering, is he going to, uh, <clears throat> is he going to frost protect the perimeter of this slab as well? Because I think that's an important consideration uh, for how he does this form work and whether or not he would want to maybe make that top two by four removable so that he could uh, get his, uh, get his out wings of insulation connecting to the two inches that he's going to have alongside the form. You know better than I do because it's your climate zone. But so uh, I would describe this uh, loosely as a frost protected shallow foundation. And uh, right. there's two ways to insulate the soil around those. Uh, one is, you know, to put it on the edge of the slab, which is what we're seeing here. And then uh, sometimes in some climate zones, you need wings, uh, which right. is and what I, I think you're I believe he would need wings around it, especially if he's in the northern part of the state. If he's in the southern part of the state. We just got moved up to, I, I think, one of the fives, uh, maybe the cooler of the two fives. Uh, so we were six. Um, we got moved to a warmer one. Uh, Wisconsin actually had the dubious distinction of having the most uh, portion of its population that changed climate zones when they uh, came out with the new, the new map a few years ago. Hmm. So that is um, a very, the, the, the IRC, the international residential code does a really great job of telling you what you need for, um, for a frost protected shallow right. foundation. You, you, you identify your um, it's actually that is frost freezing, freeze something freezing index. Yeah. Um, that you look up based on your locale and they tell you, you know, it can very, you very easily find out what you need for, um, depth of your footing, what you need for depth of vertical insulation and what you need for wings. Um, and it even, it even goes to like what you need for extra at corners, you tend to need extra wing length. Yep. Um, so it's, it's a really easy part of the code to, to look up and follow. I was, when I, um, was actually was researching that for that insulation course that we talked about in the last episode of the podcast, I was really impressed. Sometimes I'm impressed by the IRC and that was one of the cases where I was really <laughs> impressed by how kind of, uh, easy they made it for builders to, uh, to do, but I want to plug and I, 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 I have heard anecdotally some good things about, um, warm form. Um, which is a product for doing this. Yep. And I've always looked at these, and there's a, there's a few others, but warm form is one, which is basically an insulation product that be, that is both your insulation and your form. And, um, and they look so smart if you want to have um, an insulated slab foundation. They look like such a smart way to, to work. 
And this product is a, is something that you use as the form and then you would take your stakes away and the form stays. It just it's stays in place. Single and use form yeah. that has the insulation. Yeah. What does it I look th- like? Someone tell me what this is. And imagine curious. imagine just uh some I think it's EPS. Um I may be wrong about that, but imagine yeah, just they're some typically EPS. EPS yeah. yeah, shaped with like an L shape and uh you know, shaped to to create the to create your um your thickened edge and you, you have to do some ex- proper excavation at the height at which you want you, the depth at which you want the thickened edge and then the depth at which you want the slab. But you, you basically form your, um, your foundation with this, your slab with this product. Um, you lay your, you know, vapor retarder on top of it and then you can, you can run mechanicals and all that jazz. And like Ian said, you pour in it. And then when you, when you're done, you remove the stakes and now you have your insulated slab. One thing that I will point out about this particular drawing is you have to make sure that you resist the urge to nail that two inch foam board to the form because you, you don't want that to come out when you take the form out. Uh, That's something that I've seen people do numerous times is you take a couple of roofing nails and tack that to the form to keep it in place. But then when you pull the form off, you pull the foam out too. Uh, so you want to make sure that you've left that loose uh, mm. and something that can stick with the concrete. When I did the th- uh, slab for this building that I'm sitting in, I used, I think there were 60 D nails that I put through the foam and into the uh, formed space for the concrete. So then nice. once the concrete was poured, it was grabbing those yeah. big nails and holding the foam in place. And it worked pretty good. And uh, as far as brain uh, on it, Patrick. Uh, nice. it, it's cheap uh you know it's a freaking box of nails right <laughs> love it <laughs> uh, hey one one thing that confuses me about uh andrew's drawing is the two by four at the top of his form work which kind of uh seals off the the foam insulation cavity and forms the uh top of the uh form work that contains the concrete holds the insulation and it, it, it's going to create a recess in the slab which i am not crazy about because all i imagine is your car which is coated with slush and salt is going to melt and then run into this cavity that's going to be holding the bottom plate of the garage wall ultimately and it's never going to dry so yeah i think he's he's missing an opportunity to do some pretty cool building science stuff there by running that foam to the top of the uh of the slab and then somehow getting that foam to connect into the insulation in the wall as well i've seen people use like a a ripped down bottom plate typically with a two by six wall you know you rip two inches off the face of the two by six so that it can butt that foam that's then sticking up and and connecting to the insulation of the wall and you can get a a much better insulated interface between the slab and the bottom of the wall that way. What do you think, Brian, does the two by four, uh, at the top concern you? Um, the, the, when I see this, uh, when I see these details, I, 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 I think exact of just in general, exactly what Ian brought up, which is that when you try to remove this stuff, you, you know, it's going to be, it it seems like it would be tricky to do it easily without disturbing the without disturbing the phone, leaving it you know tightly secured to the concrete. And that two by four seems to add a little complexity to that removal of the form to me. So um, that was my my first thought uh, about that. But I mean, maybe not. Maybe you know you you put all that together with screws that you can back out, and um, maybe it's not uh, the issue that I think it might be. I'm not I'm not uh, graceful when I, <laughs> with stuff like this, and I, a lot of carpenters are a lot more graceful than me when it comes to, you know, um, assembling and disassembling things. So I see myself tearing it all apart, but, uh, you know, using the claw of a framing hammer. Yes, exactly. The <laughs> yes. How um, else do you do that? I, just... I tell, I tell Amy, every time I start a carpentry project, I say, just when you come by, remind me, just say to me, don't force it. Because that's my my bad habit as a carpenter. You know, this is oh, this is close enough. I'll just pound on it a little bit. It'll go in. I, you know, uh, 
Andrew was worried about having a, you know, something to screed on the top. And customarily it's just your, your, your forms that, you know, you screed off of. And, and you, I think you could screed off the edge of a two by versus uh, at horizontal just as easily. So here, here's another, uh, <clears throat> here's another idea. Why you were going to say would... helical piles, right? No, 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 no. <laughs> although, although they are great. Use, use them anywhere you can. Uh, use them in your kitchen cabinet installs. Um, why put the foam in there with the the form? If if you have this excavated around your it's slab area well enough, you can form it. You can pull the forms off with the claw of your hammer, nice and easy, and then you can just slap the foam back on and backfill it. It's a very easy thing to do to add the foam with. Oh yeah. So are you overcomplicating something that's easy or are we missing something entirely? Uh, is this pad going to sit above the ground and then uh, the builder is going to use this two by 12, two by six build out to you know, kind of finish the edge of it? You're going to need some way to protect the foam, uh, you know, at least a right. few inches of it. So maybe yeah. maybe that's the intention. And if it was PT, I think it would last a long time. But we know that uh, eventually that's going to fail and bring bugs and stuff. So I don't know if that's a great idea to leave it in there. Yeah. Well, I would suggest going to find home building and seeing a detail for this very assembly or a green building advisor because we we've done we've shown this a lot, right? Uh, I want to say it's been twenty years since I was introduced to the concept of a frost protected shallow foundation, and boy, what a great way to save money and effort in building uh, out buildings, especially. Am I remembering correctly that Andy Engel used the shallow frost protected foundation on his? shop airbnb apartment he did he totally did yeah and uh that building is holding up well i've seen it recently it's working just like it's supposed to well uh what do we uh what is our final advice to andrew about his uh building here for his garage slab I think it depends on if he's burying that edge of the slab or not. I think if he's going to bury it, he could very easily just leave the foam out of the concrete form assembly and add it later as part of backfilling it, unless there's some other uh, site restriction that he's dealing with where he needs that to be part of the pour itself. And do you think that would be a more conventional way to do this, Ian? I think it would be. Yeah. I I could see if he's got a, a really tough area to work in, like if he's uh, maybe butting this up against a stone wall or a slope or uh, some other area that's hard to get to to work on that you would want to have it done all at one time. Uh, or if he's not going to backfill it. That's the other thing I'm wondering about is if this building is intended to sit above or mm. uh, on on the ground can you do that <laughs> maybe if you added some helical piers you could <laughs> <laughs> well i hope uh, if y'all have thoughts on uh andrew's uh thick and edge slab or any other subject that we talked about today you'll write in with your thoughts and share them with us because we always appreciate hearing from you uh and thanks for joining me guys it was a pleasure hanging yeah. out with you yeah i just had a flashback to uh to the most that I was ever yelled at by the Masons that I worked for when I was like 20 years old was pulling the forms off of a uh, launched slab like this that was meant to have a fully finished face. And I, I believe I went at the forms Brian Pantalillo style with the claw of the <laughs> hammer and I and I pulled the entire face of the concrete off with the form. And that was at like probably 3.30 on a Friday or something when I did that. <laughs> and one of the guys had to stay there and, and like cream up and refinish this, uh, this face of the slab that I ruined. Did he make you stay there and, and uh, mix concrete? Yeah, or yeah, more, yeah, I'm pretty sure he made me do it, but uh, I'm, I'm sure he yelled at me the entire time. When I talk to folks about the, you know, 
occupation of trade work, I often say that you need to make all the mistakes. And I'm guessing you learned a lot from that experience, Ian. I, I actually learned a lot from working with uh, the masonry company that I worked for. Uh, I really enjoyed the carpentry part. And you know, we set modular homes and built garages, but did all the concrete flat work and block work. And I hated the concrete work and block work, but I really liked the carpentry. But I, I did learn did learn a lot about making mistakes and, and atoning for your mistakes from those guys. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Well, unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today. Thanks to Ian, Brian, and Andres for joining me. And thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to send us your comments, questions, and suggestions to fhbpodcast at finehomebuilding.com. And please like, comment, or review us however you're listening. It helps other folks find the podcast. Stay safe, everybody. Keep Craft Alive. Thanks very much for listening.